It's been over three years since the U.S. Capitol insurrection. To this day, there are still people being arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced for what they perpetrated. January 6th committee, of course, completed their investigation, issued their report. So I bet you think the story has been told. Well, think again. There's the issue of the U.S. Capitol Police. Now, while we certainly honored the members on the ground who had to directly confront the rioters and did so in heroic ways, there were more who treated that day, as well as the days leading up to January 6th and after, in, let's say, far less than heroic ways. Our next guest with her new book brings not just new facts about January 6, 2021 forward, but an examination of the groups behind it, as well as steps needed to prevent a repeat. Her book is Domestic Darkness, an insider's account of the January 6th insurrection and the future of right-wing extremism. She was the Assistant Director of Intelligence for the U.S. Capitol Police, now CEO of Pandora's Intelligence, Julie Farnham. How are you today, Julie? I'm well. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for doing this book and adding to the picture that we all need to see a lot more clearly in spite of the attempts by, well, way too many to try to cloud things over. PandorasIntelligence.com, learn more about Julie's company. And as I said, Julie, we a lot of people thought, okay, we, we've heard the story. We've got the facts. We see the arrest. We see the convictions. The story's been told. Obviously, you saw something missing from the story that had been told up to this point, which compelled you to write the book. What was it that you felt needed to be addressed? Well, after January 6th, there were a lot of people saying that it was an intelligence failure. And I know that I had provided the intelligence to the Capitol Police leadership, and they failed to plan accordingly. And so I thought it was really important that I get that piece out and let people know what the Capitol Police knew beforehand and why they ultimately failed, because there will be another January 6th. Um, uh, certification of electoral votes, and there'll be other big events on the Capitol. And I don't want to see that failure again, because it really tested our democracy, and that worries me a lot. And here, here's a couple of the crazy points based upon the, the, the foundation for your book. The, the unwillingness to be cooperative or play well with others, whatever you want to call it, with the Capitol Police and in, and intelligence and Congress and and Secret Service, it seemed to be just a, a repeat of what we saw among the intel departments that let let open the door for September 11th. And today, what we see is, to say the least, and you probably know very well too, and I've seen the websites. I'm not going to mention the the URLs for obvious reasons, but the the. Radical magas, as I call them, they're not, they weren't then and certainly now are not being secretive about their wishes, their wants, and, and their intents, are they? No, not at all. They're very vocal as they were before January 6th. Um, they continue to be now um, still denying the election results of 2020, and we're really setting themselves up for, um, you know, it's going to be Trump and Biden again. And so there very well could be more people again saying that the election results are not valid before the election even happens. As you uh, write in Domestic Darkness, you came through, as they like to say in the court of law, with a preponderance of the evidence. Why were, why were you not paid attention to? You were almost in the same seat then where that woman in Benjamin Netanyahu's inner circle was who gave a warning about Hamas. She was ignored. She was the one voice saying, watch out for Hamas or on the verge of doing something, and we know what happened there back in October. You were in that same position that she she is now. You were there then. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons. I think one fundamentally is that as a woman, it's hard to gain credibility. People look at you initially as not being credible, and you have to say what you want to say many times over before people really listen. The other part of it is I think there was a complacency and maybe even an arrogance within the Capitol Police. They deal with protests and demonstrations daily at the Capitol. And so I think there was a sense like, well, we know how to handle this. We don't need anyone's help. And so that really set them up for failure. Add to this, you certainly had had shown your, your ability to root out threats of terrorism, violence, and attacks. You, you brought attention to literally thousands of potential threats, which, which if left unaddressed, could have made for some very... Oh, dark and dangerous results. 
Yeah, absolutely. The bulk of my time at the Capitol Police, and I was there almost three years, was spent investigating threats against members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. Um, there were, you know, over 20,000 threats when I was there, and it, most of them were made on social media. And so it was my job to figure out who was making the threats and then work with the special agents to um, build a case and potentially prosecute those people making those um, offensive or not offensive threatening statements. So Julie Farnham, former assistant director of intelligence for the Capitol Police, now CEO of Pandora's Intelligence, pandorasintelligence.com, the website or book, Domestic Darkness, an insider's account of the January 6th insurrection and the future of right-wing extremism. You are listening to Issues and Ideas. The groups and their elements, which you address in, in Domestic Darkness, they're still the same groups. They, they work under the same beliefs. Are there significant differences between them, yet still looking to achieve the same goal? There are differences between the groups. Um, you know, one type of group is, you know, your white supremacist, um, ethnically, racially motivated, violent extremist. You have your militia type groups. You have your conspiracy theorists. They all believe different things. And it was interesting that on January 6th, they all came together for a common cause. Um, and a lot of them do uh, still exist, um, particularly after January 6th, we saw white supremacist groups really flourish. They've changed their tactics to a degree, some of them have, um, in that they try to be more involved in the community and do things like helping the community, like cleaning up trash, cleaning up graffiti, and trying to make that, their hate more palatable to a larger audience, and that's very, very dangerous. And with the mind, too, a lot of this hate, a lot of these conspiracies, a lot of this insanity that these groups operate under, they've actually been able to ingratiate themselves into a, a mainstream path to try to recruit and convince as many people as possible and, and have succeeded to at least some degree. Yeah, you're right. And part of that has to do with because we have every society has these fringe elements. And what we saw over the past, you know, few years seven or so, seven, eight years, is that there were politicians um, at all levels of the government that really embraced these fringe groups as like a legitimate voting bloc and brought them into the fold and brought them into the mainstream. And that empowered them and that gave them a voice and gave them a platform to spread their hate. You write in your book, and certainly if anyone listening had followed along with the aftermath of January 6th, I guess the phrase would be that the head of the snake was chopped off. Stephen Sun, who was the chief of police, Chad Thomas, head of the Uniform Operations for Capitol Police, they were forced out, rightfully so. Was that an effective response or just a show, okay, we, we did something, now let's move on? They both needed to go, for sure, but I think it's more, it, it goes deeper than that. You needed to really look at the culture of the Capitol Police, and I don't think we've done that yet. There were a lot of recommendations that came out after January 6th from various oversight authorities, and the Capitol Police has implemented those recommendations, but they were very concrete things like get training, write this policy, get this equipment, but the core of it is the culture and the lack of communication, the lack of trust, the lack of va valuing their employees. Those issues have haven't been adequately addressed, and I think that could set them up for failure again. And in the in the role that the Capitol Police has to play, if that's the, the culture and the climate, I mean, for someone listening, just think of that in a civilian workplace. Would you want to be there? If someone is there, how much of a quality person are they being there if they're tolerating this kind of stuff? Exactly. And there is a lot of turnover, and there has been a lot over a lot of turnover, especially after January 6th. And, you know, that's understandable. The officers who fought, you know, so gallantly that day, like, they they were put in an awful situation. And justifiably, they, they wanted to leave and they didn't trust their leadership after January 6th. Um, but, yeah, things definitely need to still, there's room for more improvement for sure. You mentioned before how your investigations took care of threats made to politicians of both parties. Or I guess nowadays you have to say all parties because there's independence as well as a socialist in Congress. But having said that, that certainly diffuses anyone who might want to come after you regarding a book. And I'm sure as you write that you wrote this book, you were thinking, okay, brace myself because I will hear something from somebody about this, considering the topic I'm addressing. But you're also candid about a relationship you had with someone who wound up having a connection to the Proud Boys. Not to tip off the story, because obviously it's one of the lessons in your, in, that comes out of your book, Domestic Darkness, 
Was that much like a terrorist organization does achieve through infiltration on the part of that guy's part? Um, perhaps. And, you know, I, just for a little background, I did have a relationship with Shane Lamont, who is the head of intelligence for the D.C. police. Um, his trial begins in a couple weeks, um, and he is charged with assisting the Proud Boys. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, at the time, I didn't think that I was being used, and it certainly didn't feel that way. But knowing what I know now, I mean, I think I would have not had a relationship with him. But he also didn't ever um, indicate that he was engaged in any sort of, like, extremist ideology. I knew he was working with the Proud Boys, um, but as an informant, police officer-type relationship, which seemed very normal to me. Um, but, you know, when I think about it, like, it kind of makes my head spin a little bit, because then I think, like, well, what did I miss? Was I being manipulated? How could how could this happen to me? And, you know, some of those those questions will remain unanswered, I think. Also through Julie's book, too, you'll see a lot of opportunities to connect dots that foretells what could happen. This is something we talked about, maybe if you recall listening a couple of weeks ago. Okay, fine. If Donald Trump returns into the Oval Office, who would serve with him? You can connect dots to what seem to be rational people, but they have family ties to irrational people. And we'll leave it at that. That's my tease for for the moment. But that's just one of the worthy ways that Julie's book, Domestic Darkness, and Insider's account of the January 6th insurrection, the future of right-wing extremism, it is of value. Just to wrap up with about 30 seconds, if Trump loses in November, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10, 10 being a certainty, 1 being total avoidance, what's the risk of a repeat of January 6th? I'd say it's somewhere between a 6 and 7. It's, uh, that, that's concerning, and that adds value to what Julie presents in Domestic Darkness, an insider's account of the January 6th insurrection, the future of right-wing extremism. It's a reminder for some, a lesson for many, and it's the facts for all. And that's certainly of great value. She is also the CEO of Pandora's Intelligence, pandorasintelligence.com. Julie Farnham, thank you for what you have withstood, what you're probably having to withstand, having come out with this book, and thank you for the truth, the facts, and bringing reality against conspiracies that still run rampant today. Thanks for being here. Thank you.